Friends, I'd like to tell you a story. It's called St. Peter's Barbecue. Once upon a time, there was a man named Simon. Jesus called him Petros, or Peter, the rock upon which the church was built. His friends called him Rocky because sometimes he acted like he had rocks for brains. Peter was both insightful and impulsive, which is a terrible combination. In the South, we would say he was smart as a whip one moment and then dumb as a post in the next. But Jesus saw something in Peter that not everyone else saw. Jesus loved Peter. Jesus believed in him. And he told Peter to feed God's lambs, and feed them he did. Today's story is about one such feeding. It's a story that's filled with scandal and differences of opinion. It's a story that changed the face of the church forever. Furthermore, it leaves no doubt that Jesus was right. Peter was more rock than rocky. He was indeed smart as a whip. So let's get started. Our story begins when Peter got himself into hot water with his friends in Jerusalem. They were mad because they had heard that Peter was slumming it with Gentiles in Caesarea. He stayed in their house, ate their food, and even baptized the whole lot of them. What was he thinking? You see, some of his friends thought that only Jews could be followers of Jesus. If Gentiles wanted to become disciples, they would have to become Jews first and put aside their heathen ways. After all, there are rules to be followed and protocols to be obeyed. The scriptures are quite clear. We can't just let any old riffraff become followers of Jesus, can we? We have standards to uphold. Some are in and some are definitely out. Well, it appears that Rocky is living up to his nickname. He's got some explaining to do. So Peter went to Jerusalem to face his friends and defend his actions. It was around noon, Peter began. I was praying when the wildest thing happened. I fell into some sort of a trance and saw a vision. A vision, Rocky? Really? His friends countered. Are you sure it wasn't the wine talking or maybe your overactive imagination? Come on, guys. Cut me some slack, Peter shot back. I'm being serious here. I've never had anything like this happen to me before. So be quiet and listen to what I have to say. His friends settled down in their seats and Peter continued. Like I said, I was in a deep state of prayer, and suddenly I saw a giant red and white checkered tablecloth being lowered from heaven. I kid you not, it was like the ones you use at a picnic. All four corners of the tablecloth were suspended in the air, as if they were being held up by angels, and the tablecloth was jam-packed with food. Sounds to me like your stomach was doing the talking, one of his friends said with a laugh. Yeah, I know, I've got quite an appetite, Peter replied with a smile, but wait till you hear what was in it. It was disgusting. Oy vey, not a kosher thing in it. It was a heathen picnic basket extravaganza filled with pulled pork, ostrich burgers, grilled shrimp, crab cakes, and smoked rattlesnake, which I know they say tastes like chicken, but I was not going to eat it. It was absolutely appalling. Yuck, his friend said, that's not a dream. That's a nightmare. Exactly, Peter responded. So I had a conversation with God about it, and I said, God, what's up with this nasty barbecue? I can't eat this stuff. Remember, I'm Jewish. I've never eaten this stuff. The Torah forbids it. Couldn't you have packed a more culturally appropriate menu? After all, you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You should know how to cook for your people. Peter's friends roared with laughter. Then, as the laughter subsided, Peter changed his tone and was dead serious. You'll never believe what God said to me. God said, what I have made clean, you must not profane. Lunch is served. And God told me this three times to make sure that I remembered what was said. What I have made clean, you must not profane. What God has made clean, you must not profane. What God has made clean, you must not profane. Then, as I pondered what God meant by this strange vision, the checkered tablecloth closed in on itself and it disappeared from sight. The whole thing left me scratching my noggin. Strange indeed, Peter's friends echoed in reply. But what does that have to do with the fact that we were hanging out, you were hanging out with a bunch of heathens? Peter's friends started to grumble among themselves, discussing the possible meaning of the strange vision Peter had shared with them. Peter let the conversation continue for a while. 
But after a few minutes, he raised his hand to speak. The crowd became silent. Let me finish my story. Then perhaps all of this will make sense to you. After the vision ended, three men from Caesarea came knocking on Simon the Tanner's door asking for me. You know Simon. He has that wonderful seaside house in Joppa that I love so much. Very relaxing. Anyway, they had been sent by an officer in the Italian guard, a Gentile named Cornelius, whom they said was a good man who worshipped God and gave generously to the poor. They told me that several days earlier, Cornelius had a vision, and in his vision, an angel came to him and told him to contact me. I had a message through which his entire family would be saved. A Gentile seeing angels, Peter's friends gasped. What is the world coming to? Peter, this is crazy. I know, I know, Peter responded. But after the vision ended, I felt the Spirit leading me to go with these three men without asking any questions or making a fuss. So I invited them in and gave them lodging for the night. Well, that was your first mistake, one of Peter's friends yelled. It was all downhill from there. No, it wasn't downhill at all, Peter said. In fact, it was the beginning of something new, something revolutionary that is going to change the followers of Jesus forever. Let me continue. The next day I traveled with these three men to Cornelius' house, and when I arrived there, the welcome I received was overwhelming. Cornelius fell at my feet and started to worship me, and that's something that doesn't happen very often. I was a bit dumbfounded, but reacted quickly. I took him by the hand and told him to stand up so that we could greet each other face to face. Sir, I said, there's no need for that. I'm a man and only a man, no different from you. He smiled and said to me, thank you for coming. I'm honored to have you at my house. Then Cornelius took me inside and introduced me to everyone who had gathered. His relatives and friends were there. The place was packed and everyone was eager to hear what I had to say. As I began my introductory remarks, it dawned on me what the strange vision in Joppa was all about and why God had brought me to this household. So I told the crowd, everyone here knows that I'm a Jew. According to the laws of my people, I'm not supposed to be socializing with Gentiles. It's forbidden. But here I am, and here you are. And I want you to know that God has shown me that we are all God's children. I will not call you profane or unclean. You are my spiritual siblings. After I said this, a thunderous applause rose from the gathered people. There were no walls or barriers between Jews and Gentiles that day. God's love had torn them down. We were one people. Peter, you can't be serious, a friend interrupted. I'm a pious Jew and a follower of Jesus. I just can't go there. But you must, Peter replied. And we will go even further than that. But first, let me finish my story. After the applause died down, I shared with them the story of Jesus, his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection. I ended by saying that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins and life through his name. And while I was sharing the good news, the Holy Spirit tore through that place like a Pentecost wildfire. People were singing and praising God, and it was a miraculous sight to see. I was so overwhelmed with joy that I invited everyone to be baptized on the spot. Every single person in that household came forward. My friends, I wish you could have been there to see it. A hush fell over Peter's gathered friends. Not a single voice rose to argue with him. Seeing that everyone was listening to what he had to say, Peter, the rock, not Rocky, brought his thoughts to a close. My friends, if God gave these so-called heathen Gentiles the same gift of the Spirit that God gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? Who was I that I could dare call one of God's children profane or unclean? Friends, I believe we've been doing this all wrong. We need to repent. We've profaned a lot of people. We've been putting barriers between others and God when we should have been the ones who were breaking those barriers down. We've been petty and judgmental, acting like self-righteous Pharisees who follow the letter of the Torah but totally missed its spirit. It's the kind of stuff that drove Jesus crazy. Today is a new day, 
We're going to do things differently now. The good news of Jesus is not just meant for the Jews. It's meant for all people in all tribes and all nations. What God has made clean, we must not profane. Do you hear me? What God has made clean, we must not profane. Let me tell you that one more time. What God has made clean, we must not profane. When Peter finished his story, his friends praised God saying, Thank you, Peter, for showing us that God intends to invite more people to the barbecue banquet than we could have possibly imagined. God is doing a new thing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The End Well, my dear friends, this story speaks to the modern church just as powerfully as it spoke to the early church, and you can read this encounter in the book of Acts. Like Peter and those first disciples, each of us has people in our lives whom we label as profane or unclean. Each of us has prejudices and judgmental attitudes that we need to dismantle. Anytime we hear ourselves saying, well, you know how those people are, ugh, we've stumbled upon our personal prejudice. God forgive us for our ignorance. This prejudice is different for everyone. For some, it might be transgendered people. For others, it might be the homeless, the poor, Hispanics, those refugees from Afghanistan, and the, or perhaps those who even belong to a different political party than us. So God forgive us for our ignorance. Jesus in his gospel lesson indicated that people will know we are disciples of Christ by the way we show love to our neighbors, and that is all of our neighbors. Jesus said, just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Perhaps if we started loving our neighbors more fully instead of judging and criticizing them, they might actually want to hear what we have to say. What God has called clean, we must not profane. Let us love all of our neighbors more fully this week and try to see everyone we meet as a beloved child of God. Amen.